Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute. Um, my name is Michael Le Chevalier. I'm Associate Director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Um, Lumen Christi is a Catholic educational nonprofit uh, founded in 1997 by scholars at the University of Chicago. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a vital dialogue partner at the university and with our broader culture. Um, we do this through non-credit courses, through master classes, lectures, and symposia. Um, this web series is in fact an outgrowth of our non-credit course, which normally uh, in about a month would begin gathering students 35 to 40 around a table to learn more about the Christian intellectual tradition in its depth and in its variety. Um, and now we reach hundreds of people each week through this ongoing web series. Um, you can see more of our past series uh, from our YouTube channel or on our webpage. Um, it's thinking about this non-credit course series that uh, it's with great sadness that I announced that a core staff member who has been helping us within our university program um, running these non-credit courses um, and uh, offering great books lectures downtown actually passed away today, Father Paul Mankowski. Um, Father Paul was a scholar in residence at the Lumen Christi Institute. Um, he was a Jesuit priest, um, a scholar of Semitic language and culture, and a great, great man who had an impact on countless students and lay people. Um, in a few minutes, Father Andrew, who is moderating this series, will help us at the Institute. And those of you who are joining us, bring our gratitude um, and grief for Father Paul's life into prayer. Um, here at the Institute, we are committed in our work to sharing with Catholics and non-Catholics alike the breadth and depth of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And so it is with great excitement that we launched this series that draws attention, attention to the vantage point of Christians who worship and think and pray in continuity with the first thousand years of the undivided church. This series is co-presented with the God Bearer Institute and co-sponsored by the Beatrice Institute, the Calvert House Catholic Center, the Catholic Theological Union, the Institute for Faith and Culture, God With Us Online, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University, the St. Benedict Institute, the St. Paul University Catholic Center, the St. Stephen Byzantine Catholic Church, and the Tabor Life Institute. We're grateful for each of these co-sponsors who've helped make this series a success. You too can help advance our programming in two different ways. First, you can advertise. This is just the first of, an, of a series that is actually going to last um, throughout uh, the month of September into October and then with another event in November. Um, please, as you get advertisements about this, feel free to share it on with others. Um, second, you can also help financially contribute to make series like this possible possible by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Um, I'm especially grateful to be having moderating this series, um, Father Andrew Summerson, who has also helped to organize the series. Father Andrew is a priest of the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Parma and serves um, St. Mary Parish in Whitting, Indiana. He received his doctorate in patristic theology at the Pontifical Patristic Institute Augustinarium in 2018. And his book, Divine Scripture and Human Emotion in Maximus the Confessor, is forthcoming. Um, I'll uh, save a fuller introduction for him for another week and invite now Father Andrew to um, unmute himself and turn on his video. Father Andrew. Thank you, Michael. Um, welcome, everybody, to this first installment of Catholic Theology, Eastern Catholic Theology in Action. Uh, before we even begin this evening, I think it would be very appropriate, uh, Father Paul Mankowski, uh, staff member, the scholar in residence at the Lumen Christi Institute, um, was a very beautiful priest, a really fine man, dedicated his life to the prayer and the sacraments of the church and to scholarship, particularly in the area of biblical philology. Uh, so I think it's only appropriate that we pray for him together as a community, even though we're virtual. Uh, so I would offer a prayer from our own uh, Byzantine Catholic tradition uh, the prayer that we pray for the deceased, at which point, after I'll intone uh, the biblical idiom that we sing, everlasting memory, uh, which comes from the scriptures, which is not a reminder for us to remember Father Paul forever, but is a reminder that God, when he remembers people, 
when he bears in mind everybody in the scriptures, uh, he sustains them in life and brings them uh, to eternity with him. So that's what we ask for for Father Paul. Uh, and with that in mind, we begin beneath the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God of spirits and of all flesh, you trampled death and broke the power of the devil and granted life to your world. Now grant rest, O Lord, to the soul of your newly departed servant, the priest Paul, in a place of light, joy, and peace, where there is no pain, sorrow, nor mourning. As a good and loving God, forgive every sin committed by him in word, deed, or thought. Since there is no one who lives and does not sin, you alone are without sin. Your justice is eternal justice, and your word is truth. For you are the resurrection, the life, and the repose of your departed servant, Paul, o, the priest Paul, O Christ, our God. And we give glory to you with your eternal Father, your all-holy, good, and life-creating spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. In blessed repose, grant, O Lord, eternal rest to your departed servant, the priest Paul, and remember him forever. Everlasting Thank you very much, Deacon Daniel, Father Roman, and uh, the members of the choir at St. Elias Parish. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we turn our thoughts now to the subject at hand. Uh, this webinar, Eastern Catholic Theology in Action. In 1964, Pope Paul VI promulgated the Second Vatican Council's decree on the Eastern Churches, Orientalium Ecclesiatum, in its opening paragraph, the decree urges the Eastern Catholic churches to cultivate their own traditions. While emphasizing the antiquity of these traditions, antiquarian curiosity does not drive this movement backward. The Holy See has enough churches turned into museums. Rather, this impetus leans forward as the document clearly states that the Eastern Rites have the obligation to preach the gospel to the whole world. To paraphrase the leader of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, Sviatoslav Shevchuk, what is needed to do this is not dead traditionalism, but a living tradition. The recovery and promotion of the Eastern traditions of the Catholic Church is thus of theological consequence. We read in Orientalium Ecclesiarum, for in the Eastern churches, there remains conspicuous the tradition that has been handed down from the apostles through the fathers, and that forms the part of the divinely revealed and undivided heritage of the universal church. The Eastern Catholic churches in their liturgy, theology, spirituality, discipline, and culture enjoy a particular closeness to the first 1,000 years of Christianity and bring that alive today. In this way, they manifest a share of divine revelation that is uniquely their own and provide a more integral reception of divine revelation that benefits the entire church. This webinar series responds to the mandate of Orientalium Ecclesiarum and features leading scholars in the field to offer their theological perspectives drawn from the wisdom of the Christian East. Experts in liturgy, patristics, and ecclesiology 
as well as seasoned church leaders, will draw our attention to the vantage points of Christians who worship and live in continuity with these 23 diverse traditions of the Catholic Church. It is our sincere hope that the lens through which these churches experience the Lumen Christi, the light of Christ, that that lens might refract and re expose us to hues of the radiant resurrected Lord we might not have encountered before, but ever so in need. And so our first speaker in this series is Deacon Daniel Galadza. Deacon Galadza received his doctorate in liturgy at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome and is currently a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies at the University of, University of Regensburg and a member of the Patriarchal Liturgical Commission of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church in Kyiv. Dr. Galadza's research focuses on the historical development of liturgy, particularly the Byzantine Rite, as well as modern and contemporary Orthodox and Eastern Catholic worship and church singing. His book, Liturgy and Byzantinization in Jerusalem, was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And here to introduce us to liturgical mystagogy is my dear friend and colleague, Deacon Daniel Galadza. Please unmute and show your screen, Deacon Daniel. I'll also remind you that uh, you will be able to ask questions at the end of this, and uh, you can put those as you think of them in the question and A box that is down here at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, Deacon Daniel. Uh, thank you, Father Andrew, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to you today uh, to present several thoughts on mystagogy and liturgical theology. Liturgical theology and mystagogy are certainly not unique to or exclusive to Eastern Catholic churches. And in fact, most of what I'm going to talk about today is from the Byzantine tradition that is common to both Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholics of the Byzantine Rite. But uh, both Catholics and Orthodox will agree that liturgy is both the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed, and at the same time, the font from which all her power flows, as stated in the Second Vatican Council's Constitution on Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. Eastern Catholics have, however, often lost the authentic idiom of their liturgical tradition. And so the Second Vatican Council's decree on the Eastern Catholic Churches, Orientalium Ecclesiarum, uh, paragraph six, also reminds the Eastern Catholic Churches to preserve their liturgical rite and established way of life and to take steps to return to their ancestral traditions. Subsequent papal pronouncements make it clear that Eastern Catholics are to do this by working together with their Orthodox brothers and sisters to maintain and renew their common heritage. Thus, I hope that what I say here today is also a value to Orthodox and not only Eastern Catholics. So my goal here this uh, evening is to present the common Byzantine liturgical understanding of hymnography as a source of liturgical reflection on a theological reflection on what happens in liturgy. So I'll begin with a brief presentation of the term mystagogy as a literary genre of liturgical commentaries before shifting to the other meaning of mystagogy, that is the celebration itself of the mystery of Christ and how this is expressed through the hymnography in the Byzantine tradition. Then I'll give some examples from the liturgical year and the liturg liturgy of the hours and conclude with consideration on the actual performance or execution or singing of hymnography uh, in two authors, fathers of the church, separated in time by more than 1,000 years, but united in a similar understanding of the nature of worship and liturgy. So the word mystagogy, mystagogia, can have two meanings. It can refer either to the celebration of the sacraments or mysteries, or to an explanation of the sacraments. By the word's literal meaning, leading into a mystery, it has come to be used to define a literary genre known as liturgical commentary. Many church fathers from the fourth to the eighth century wrote such commentaries to explain the mysteries of baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist to the faithful, 
who had recently, that is in the fourth century, been initiated into the Christian faith amid the waves of new conversions after Christianity had become the officially recognized religion of the Roman Empire. So something similar perhaps to what was going on in Eastern Europe after the fall of communism, this wave of baptisms and joining the church in the early 90s. Back to the early Christian church, Theodore of Mopsuestia, an Antiochian theologian and bishop in the fifth century writes, every sacrament consists in the representation of unseen and unspeakable things through signs and symbols. Such things require explanation and interpretation for the sake of the person who draws nigh unto the sacrament so that he might know its power. In order to explain the liturgical rites to the faithful, church fathers adopted exegetical methods used for the scriptures to explain the sacraments. Thus, a literal and a spiritual meaning could be found in the text, with the spiritual meaning further divided into a dogmatic level, which interpreted the Old Testament as it referred to Christ, a moral level relating the allegorical sense to our Christian life, and the eschatological level, referring to the future kingdom and our present contemplation of it. Such approaches to explaining the liturgy were further divided between Alexandrian spiritualizing tendencies and Antiochian literal or historicizing approaches. Thus, the Alexandrian style mystagogy attributed to Dionysius the Areopagite reminds the faithful initiated into the mysteries about the unity of heaven and earth through symbols which are not arbitrary, but have a purpose, namely to lift us up to God. On the other hand, St. Maximus Confessor's mystagogy follows the tropological or moral approach and is just as much about moral and ethical life reflecting God as it is about liturgy. Antiochian style authors such as St. Germanus of Constantinople in the eighth century applied multiple layers of meaning to liturgical rites, explaining them through the earthly life of Jesus Christ as well as through the heavenly liturgy. Thus, for St. Germanus, the church building is an earthly heaven where God dwells and walks about, but it also represents the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And you see on the slide here, various parts of the church building, the architecture, and the equivalence, the symbolic meaning that St. Germanus applies to them. For example, the apse in the main part of the church, is both the cave in Bethlehem and the cave where Jesus was buried. So various layers of meaning applied to one and the same place. This explicit connection between the church building and the life of Christ, a hallmark of Antiochian mystagogies, is further emphasized in other references to the topography of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. St. Germanus was aware of at least some details of the topography of the Holy Land, since he alludes to certain details of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. However, these are completely secondary because St. Germanus's interpretation of the church building is so symbolic that it disregards any functional aspects of a church building, something made possible by the adaptability of Byzantine liturgical rites, regardless of where they were celebrated. So they didn't depend on being in Jerusalem in the holy places, the place where the earthly events of Christ's life took place, or in Constantinople for that matter, where St. Germanus was writing, the Byzantine imperial capital and the throne of the ecumenical patriarch. And it wouldn't matter if he were in Kiev or in New York or Chicago or Gary, Indiana. No matter where you were in the world, you participated in the same divine liturgy that took you to the holy places, the life-giving cross, the tomb, the resurrection from the dead on the third day, the ascension into heaven as the Byzantine anaphora praise to this day. Germanus's view was the view from Constantinople and has become the dominant approach in the Byzantine rite until this day. It is, however, noteworthy that after the fifth century in Jerusalem, there were no further explanatory texts or liturgical commentaries, mystagogies, on the divine liturgy and the rites of Christian initiation, or at least we don't know of any that appear after the fifth century. So in other words, after the pre-baptismal and mystagogical catechesis of the fourth century that are attributed to St. Cyril of Jerusalem, the literary genre of mystagogy or liturgical commentary disappears from Jerusalem. In its place, the clergy and monks of Jerusalem, such as St. John of Damascus, St. Andrew of Crete, and others, 
chose another literary genre through which to explain the liturgy and the mysteries to the faithful, namely hymnography. Hymnography had the advantage of being part of the structure of the liturgical services themselves and explained to the faithful what was happening during the services rather than explaining to the faithful before or after the celebration of the mysteries what they had experienced or what they were going to experience. In this way, hymnography has an exegetical function providing a commentary on scripture and the mystery of salvation in Christ. St. Maximus Confessor adds to hymnography's exegetical character by emphasizing its moral qualities. The spiritual enjoyment of the divine hymns signified the vivid delights of the divine blessings by moving souls toward the clear and blessed love of God by arousing them further to the hatred of sin. So without going into the complexities of Byzantine liturgical terminology, uh, for which I would recommend some basic resources such as the Oxford Dictionary of Byzantium, three volumes that has a lot of entries on various terms that you'll hear in this presentation, like stichiron or um, atroparion, other such terms, or the um, history of Byzantine music and hymnography by Egon Velis uh, from 1962, still a standard reference work. Um, if you want more technical stuff, uh, that's where you'll be able to find it. But nevertheless, a simple classification of hymns based on the character of their contents can uh, be found in this list. So six different categories. This is from Ivan Gartner's uh, introduction to Russian Orthodox Church music. So the first is, in the strict sense, a hymn that is a poetic text that offers God praise through doxology or prayer through devotion. In the divine liturgy at the hymn right before the epiclesis of the anaphora, the faithful sing, we sing of you, we bless you, we thank you, O Lord, and we pray to you, our God. Expressions of blessing, thanksgiving, and prayer. The second type is of a dogmatic nature. Here you have the stichiron from Pentecost, the Vespers of Pentecost, which begins, come all you nations of the world, let us adore God in three holy persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. And it continues to give a summary of Trinitarian theology. The next category that describes historical events. So here, a stichiron from Palm Sunday, from the Matins. It begins six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany and his disciples approached him saying, Lord, where do you wish us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? But he sent them saying, Go to the village opposite and you will find a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him and say to the master of the household, the teacher says, I am celebrating Passover with you along with my disciples. So a recounting of the biblical accounts, literally singing the scriptures. You even have quotations of Christ quoting himself, talking to the disciples. So a narration of a historical event. Hymns of a moralistic nature, which do not address God, but the listener as a kind of sung sermon. This is sung at Matins on Tuesday mornings. Many times as I come to the end of singing hymns, I am found to be full of sin. For though I utter songs with my tongue, with my soul, I think on foul things, but set both aright, Christ God, through repentance and save me. So even a reflection on the, the act of singing uh, in the hymnography of, in the Byzantine tradition, kind of self-reflection during worship. Next one, a contemplative nature of hymns. This is from the Feast of the Encounter. We're told to search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the gospels, for in them we find him brought to birth and wrapped in swaddling clothes, nursed and given suck, accepting circumcision and carried by Simeon. A kind of meditation on the incarnation of Christ, the birth, the circumcision, Christ being brought to the temple. And then finally, hymns that accompany liturgical actions. So I would argue that the per a perfect example of hymnography's function in explaining the liturgical rites themselves can be found in the cherubic hymn, which is sung at the great entrance or the transfer of the gifts of bread and wine to the altar during the divine liturgy. And the text is as follows. Let us who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn to the life giving Trinity. Now lay aside all cares of life that we may receive the King of all escorted invisibly by ranks of angels Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. 
And before I go further, let me just reiterate that all these texts are actually sung. So I'm just reading them to you, but you'd normally hear them sung into various melodies to the, psych the standard system of eight tones or other melodies in the church various church traditions. So returning to this cherubic hymn, as an example that accompanies liturgical actions and explains to them what to the faithful what is going on. So here, rather than applying meaning to the great entrance by explaining it as a burial procession of Christ to the tomb, symbolized by the altar, as one might expect from the mystagogy of St. Germanos of Constantinople or others in the Antiochian tradition, Father Rab Robert Taft analyzes the meaning of the Trubic hymn as a mystagogy of our own participation in the divine liturgy. In this text of the hymn, the king of all whom we receive is the Lord in his body and blood in the Eucharist, but also as the word of God in the proclamation of the scriptures, so that the thrice holy hymn refers both to the Sanctus of the Anaphora, holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth, and the Trisagion in the liturgy of the word, holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. And so the Trubic hymn explains to the faithful what is going on in the liturgical rites precisely at the moment when we pass from the liturgy of the word to the liturgy of the Eucharist. In Jerusalem, in the first Christian millennium, such hymns were found throughout the divine liturgy as entrance hymns during the procession into the church, as hymns after the gospel reading that summarize the text of the gospel reading, as hymns during the transfer of the gifts, and as hymns at the dismissal of the liturgy. In all cases, these were variable hymns that expounded the scriptures or the meaning of the commemoration being celebrated and explaining them to the faithful. So you wouldn't have the same hymns every Sunday or every feast day, you would have a different hymn at the transfer of the gifts. For those that know the Byzantine rite, it would mean that you wouldn't have the Trubic hymn every divine liturgy, you would have a different hymn that related to the content of the feast being celebrated. So for the uh, scholars in the audience, there are a few studies of ancient hymnography in Jerusalem, uh, such as the monographs of Helmut Lieb, who is an uh, organist actually at uh, Stift Geras in Austria, um, a monograph on the hymnographic tradition of Jerusalem, uh, in the, from the fifth to the eighth century, and also an analysis specifically of the Feast of the Incarnation of Christ. So the Nativity and Theophany, the Manifestation of Christ um, by Hans Michael Schneider, both um, fortunately or unfortunately only in German. But if you want English uh, work on hymnography from Jerusalem in particular, there's the work of Stig Simeon Freusov, whom you can uh, see on academia.edu. Uh, his article on the Oktoichos uh, is accessible. They're published in St. Vladimir's Theological Quarterly. For the current Byzantine rite, the Cherubic hymn, which is a fixed hymn sung at all but two divine liturgies during the year, is but one example found in the divine liturgy, whereas additional and variable hymns are abundant not at the Eucharist in the Byzantine rite, but in the propers of the Liturgy of the Hours, where in the cycle of hymns in the eight tones from the Octoikos, so you can look that up in the Oxford Dictionary of Byzantium, a book of hymns with appropriate or propers for the movable cycle connected to Sundays, or hymns for every day of the liturgical year in the Meneon, so a 12 volume uh, book of hymns for every day of the year from September 1st, the beginning of the new year in Byzantium to August 31st collections of these hymns sung during the Liturgy of the Hours. These offer many more examples than just the Divine Liturgy would. Before moving to the examples of hymnography, a word about their contents in the Byzantine Rite, namely the Liturgy of the Hours and the liturgical year. So the context of these hymns in the liturgical year Liturgical year as a term is a relatively recent concept developed only in the 16th century, which explains why we might find festal homilies or sermons for a specific liturgical seasons, but no ancient patristic mystagogies for the whole liturgical year. Father Lev Gillet, a disciple of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky and later writing under the pseudonym, a monk of the Eastern church, notes that the liturgical year is more than simply a series of days in the calendar 
or a pedagogical tool that teaches the faithful about the gospel readings from the liturgy or a way of prayer through the corpus of beautiful hymns sung in church. These are all important elements, of course, but Father Lev points to something more. The liturgical year is a special means of union with Christ. In the liturgical year, we are called to relive the whole life of Christ from Christmas to Easter, Easter to Pentecost, and we are exhorted to unite ourselves to Christ in his birth, in his growth, to Christ's suffering, to Christ's dying, to Christ in triumph, and to Christ inspiring his church. The liturgical year forms Christ in us. The formation of Christ in the Christian faithful through the liturgical year is a continuation of the formation that took place at birth into new life during the rites of initiation, namely baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist. In the prayers of the Byzantine rite baptism today, already found in the earliest prayers of the Evkologion or sacramentary in the Latin rite, or the Trebnik in Slavonic, and these texts are already extant in eighth century manuscripts and contemporaneous with some of the hymns that we're discussing here today. In this prayer at baptism, the priest explicitly asks God to, quote, form your Christ in the one who is about to be reborn. So this formation, forming of Christ in us happens at new birth and continues throughout the, the, our lives through the liturgical year. And uh, on the topic of formation, formation of the self, uh, one can uh, look up Derek Kruger's book, Liturgical Subjects, uh, which has an analysis of Byzantine hymnography focusing on penitential aspects and the uh, themes of repentance in Byzantine hymnography. So Father Lev Gillet repeats a Latin saying, Anus es Christus, the liturgical year is Christ, that reminds us of the centrality of Christ in all liturgical actions, rites, and in liturgical life. Christ is the new Pascha, Christ is the new temple, Christ is the new high priest, as we hear from the Holy Apostle Paul. As Pope Leo the Great states in his sermon for Ascension, that which was visible in our Redeemer is passed on to the sacraments by virtue of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection in the Paschal mystery. The incorporation of saints and martyrs into the liturgical year should also be understood as nothing else than pointing to their witness to the transformative power of the mystery of Christ in their own lives as examples for us. In the epistle to the Romans, St. Paul exhorts the believers to make a sacrifice of our very being to, I quote Romans 12, 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your rational worship, logiki latria. There are various translations of that phrase, spiritual worship, um, rational worship is the one I'm going with here. And this phrase, logiki latria, or rational worship, is repeated in both the divine liturgy and the liturgy of the hours as a definition of what Christian worship is. During the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit at the anaphora of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the priest thanks God the Father for accepting this liturgy from our hands and then begins calling the act of offering a logiki latria or rational worship in itself. He prays, further, we offer to you this rational and unbloody worship. And we ask, we pray, and we entreat you. Send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts here present. The fact that we ask the Father to send down the Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts shows that, to quote Father Taft, the purpose of the Eucharist is not to change bread and wine, but to change you and me. Through baptism and Eucharist, it is we who are to become Christ for one another as a sign to the world that is yet to hear his name. That is what Christian liturgy is all about, because that is what Christianity is all about. But this phrase, logiki latria, rational worship, is not only used to describe the Eucharistic celebration linked so closely to sacrifice and a material offering. In the first stichiron or hymn of the eighth tone at Vespers on Saturday evenings at Psalm 140, the church praises Christ singing, we offer you, O Christ, an evening hymn and rational worship because you were well pleased to have mercy on us through the resurrection. Here, it is the gathered church that offers an evening hymn and rational worship to Christ in remembrance of his resurrection. The actions of gathering, commemorating, and singing 
constitute a sacrifice that involves the whole person. It is a visible act of the whole church that requires a physical presence in gathering because a group that does nothing as a group is not a group. Again, quotation from Robert Taft. This is also a remembrance of God's mercy, which requires our minds, although anamnesis is not limited simply to psychological recall because Christ is present here and now. And singing involves the whole being, mind and body, mouth and lungs, legs and shoulders, in order to praise God, the whole body, the whole soul, and the whole mind. It is only by offering the living sacrifice of our own being, by dying and rising with Christ, that we can dare to participate in the Eucharistic sacrifice of Christ. In this way, the church enters into the Paschal mystery and sings of the events in the life of Christ as happening today in the various troparia and stichera that adorn the feasts of the liturgical today. That way we can sing, today Christ is born in Bethlehem. Today he is hung upon a tree, he who hung the earth upon the waters. Today, the whole creation rejoices and is glad, for Christ has risen and hell has been despoiled. To say that the resurrection of Christ is central to Christian faith seems obvious, so as to be redundant. However, to say that baptism is integral to the celebration of Pascha or Easter may not be as obvious to members of Eastern Catholic churches. Nevertheless, we still find today numerous remnants of the widespread practice of baptism on the eve of Pascha in the liturgical tradition. The Pauline hymn, All You Who Have Been Baptized Into Christ, which is Galatians 3.27, sung on Holy Saturday and throughout Easter and Bright Week. The Holy Saturday Vigil, with its readings explaining the typology of the Old Testament and its realization in the New Testament, in the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Christ and in the hymns of Pascha that remind us of our death and life with Christ through baptism. On Easter Sunday morning itself, the hymnography of the canon of Pascha offers a treasury of meditation upon the mystery of Christ. The hymns remind us of the truly joyful good news of Christ's resurrection. The day of resurrection, let us be radiant, O peoples. We shall see Christ shining forth and shall see him clearly saying, rejoice as we sing the triumphal song. Let the heavens, as is fitting, rejoice, and let the earth be glad that the whole world, both seen and unseen, keep feast. For Christ has risen our eternal joy. The hymns of the Paschal Canon offer an explanation of the services of Holy Saturday as well. Therefore, offering an explanation of baptism. Yesterday I was buried with you, O Christ. Today I rise with you as you arise. Yesterday I was crucified with you. Glorify me with you, Savior, in your kingdom. Why this is not always so clear depends on two main factors. The first problem is that Eastern Catholics rarely baptize people on Holy Saturday. So the practice has been restored and become widespread in the Roman Catholic Church and should be encouraged in Eastern Catholic churches as well. The second factor is a problem of folklore. Rather than emphasizing death and new life in Christ at Pascha, many East Slavic folkloric traditions in particular, instead of putting an emphasis on the resurrection of Christ, put an emphasis on blessing meat and dairy products. While the practice of Christianizing folk and agricultural practices is certainly necessary to understand the goodness of God's creation, I'm not saying not to bless meat and dairy products on Easter, but today it is often the case that these folklore traditions replace the original cultural expression of the Paschal mystery. The celebration of Sunday is a weekly remembrance of the Paschal mystery revisited, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. While church documents remind us that every week on the day which the church has called the Lord's Day, she keeps the memory of the Lord's resurrection, most Eastern Catholic parishes, however, only celebrate the divine liturgy, which is much the same as any other day of the week, although hopefully more solemn and with more people in attendance. If we wanted to hear the gospel proclamation of the resurrection and were to limit ourselves just to attending the divine liturgy, we would hear it in the Byzantine rite only three or four times a year, on Holy Saturday, on Bright Tuesday, 
and on the Sunday of the myrrh bearing women. And at least the conclusion, the 11th Matins Gospel, where Christ appears to the apostles and Peter uh, in the end of the Gospel of John on the sole Saturday before Pentecost. However, it's at Matins that the proclamation of the resurrection of Christ is read from the Gospel almost every Sunday of the year, even during Great Lent. And immediately following the joyful news of the resurrection that the faithful hear in the Gospel, they respond with the hymn, having seen the resurrection of Christ. The hymnography of Sunday Vespers and Matins is full of Christian charismatic statements that are a lesson in catechism for the faithful. For example, the Stichira in Tone 3 that were sung last week or, or two weeks ago, for some of you at Vespers, recount the events of Christ's crucifixion, death, and descent into Hades, the resurrection from the dead, but place us as beneficiaries and witnesses of, the, of those life-giving events. So we sing about the cross, the resurrection, the consubstantial trinity. We praise the savior who took flesh from the virgin and we recount Christ's descent into Hades. And we again are those beneficiaries. We ask Christ to deliver your people from the hand of your foes. There are other hymns, such as the dogmatic Theotokia, that provide short summary statements on the incarnation of Christ, weaving together Old Testament typology, New Testament passages, and direct them towards our understanding of the Mother of God, the Theotokos, the God-bearer. In a similar way, the Stichira and Exapostilaria, so hymns meant for sending out on mission of the 11 Sunday Matins Resurrectional Gospels, function as short summaries of the events recounted in the Gospel readings repeating many of the phrases of the gospels in the hymnography verbatim. In this manner, we not only venerate, read, kiss, and study the texts of the gospels, but we also sing them. At the very end of Matins, we are reminded that what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard is to be preached to the world in order that it may know the peace of Christ. But again, these texts are not just catechetical or pedagogical, they are doxological since they are sung together during the liturgical services in praise of Christ. And even in Great Lent, despite the penitential character of this season, throughout the 40 days, the resurrection is always in focus. We sing at Sunday Vespers on the eve of the beginning of Lent, let us begin the all holy season of fasting with joy. Let us shine with bright radiance of the holy commandments of Christ our God, with the brightness of love and the splendor of prayer, the strength of good courage and the purity of holiness. So clothed in the garments of light, let us hasten to the holy resurrection on the third day that shines on the world with the glory of eternal life. Entering more fully into, the, into Sunday and the Paschal mystery leads directly to a clearer understanding of the incarnation, the nativity of Christ and Christmas. Although we were born to have eternal life with God, Christ was the only person who was born to die in order to save humanity and raise us with himself. This connection between the birth and death of Christ or the womb and the tomb is, cru is crucial to understanding the mystery of the incarnation and is visible in the iconography of the feast where Christ is wrapped in garments that are both swaddling clothes and burial clothes. The parallels are made visible in hymnography. For example, the Stichiron of the ninth hour for the Nativity of Christ copies the same Stichiron or hymn for the ninth hour on Holy Friday, so on Good Friday. On the Nativity of Christ, we sing, Today is born of a virgin, he who holds creation in the hollow of his hand. But on Good Friday, we sing, Today he is hung upon a tree, he who hung the earth upon the waters. And the parallels continue. Instead of being wrapped in swaddling rags, the one who cannot be handled, he is arrayed with a crown of thorns, the king of angels, and so on. More recently, an ancient Byzantine hymn was discovered that makes the connection even clearer using the melody and rhythm of the Easter Tropadion, the main Easter hymn, Christ is Risen from the Dead, for a Christmas hymn. So on Easter, Pascha, Almost any Eastern Catholic of the Byzantine rite, any Orthodox will know by heart the Easter Tropadion, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death by death and to those in the tombs giving life. 
in a manuscript discovered on Mount Sinai in 1975, there's another hymn that takes the exact meter in Greek and uh, addresses it, uh, adapts it for the nativity of Christ, for Christmas. Christ is born upon the earth in a manger, wearing swaddling clothes. He broke the bonds of our transgression. And if you uh, search for this in Google, Christos etechti epigis, you can find even uh, some chanters in Greece singing this to the Easter melody on YouTube. So these are all just a few examples of the theological content of hymnography in the Byzantine Rite. So thus far, I've been talking about hymns without saying anything about their musical qualities. And let's not forget, hymnography was intended for singing, not reading. Theologians, both from the first and second millennium, had quite a lot to say about that, being highly aware of the theological implications of singing and what this does to the human person and the Christian community. St. Theodore Studite, a monk who revived communal monastic life in Constantinople in the ninth century, addresses several themes in church singing. The first theme that appears in St. Theodore Studite's comments on church singing addresses those who should sing. Who does he believe should sing in church? Consistent with his views on living the gospel message, every baptized person should participate equally. And when he talks about monks, he just says they should do what every Christian should do, but more intensely, because they have free time to do it, or at least they should. In Great Catechesis 2, St. Theodore makes it quite clear that he insists upon common participation in psalmody. He writes, you that remain during all services with your lips closed like animals without reason, open your mouth and attract the spirit, sing psalms to the Lord with understanding. And singing with understanding, Psalm 46, 8, is one of St. Theodore's major concerns regarding proper conduct in prayer. Despite his insistence upon common participation, Theodore did not tolerate disorder. St. Theodore's comments on order in church singing reflect the liturgical context of his time, including different responsibilities attributed to duties or offices we may be familiar with today. For example, the job of the kanonar, one of the leaders of singing in the ninth century and a practice you can still find today in uh, particularly in monasteries, involved much more than just singing. St. Theodore describes the kanonar's duties in an epigram. You who lead the singing of the lyre, show yourself as a trumpet for the composition of wondrous music. Sound the wood at the appropriate time. Move your tongue as if wielding a plectrum. Always introduce the verse becomingly in due order, sweet sounding, as a fine musical instrument. Harmonize the mouth of the brotherhood. Always order everyone worthily, not according to favor, neither anger, nor to cause grief, but in the just way and manner. For you are all part of God's body and yours. Thus, if you are so minded, you will receive your crown from God. As envisioned by St. Theodore, the work involves much more spiritual focus in recognizing the image and likeness of God in each member of the body of Christ, thereby receiving divine reward. Leading the singing is only a small part of the canonarch's task, whose goal is ultimately to be a good shepherd of his brethren and to multiply the talents that God has given them. The benefits of church singing that St. Theodore identifies are ultimately spiritual even if some may also have pedagogical value. In the process of singing with understanding, Theodore writes that, quote, we will find repose for our souls, we will be a good example for others, serving God in this as well, and will inherit eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, receiving the crown of salvation. A little more than 1,000 years later, the Greco-Catholic Metropolitan of Lviv in present-day Western Ukraine, Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, issued a decree from the Lviv Archiparchial Council of 1941 entitled Regarding Church Singing. Sheptitsky was a great admirer of St. Theodore Studite, translating some of his works into modern Ukrainian and reestablishing authentic Eastern monastic life in the Greco-Catholic Church under the patronage of St. Theodore Studite. In his decree regarding church singing, Metropolitan André navigates the potential problems between various factions in his church, 
proposing a balanced theological foundation. And keep in mind that Metropolitan Andre is writing about church singing in 1941, in the heat of the Second World War, during which his archeparchy suffered on two fronts, at the hands of the Soviets and at the hands of the Nazis. He was by no means a negligent pastor, and on the contrary, he was known for his care and concern for his flock. Nevertheless, he obviously believed that church singing was so important to Christian life that this needed to be emphasized in a con conciliar document, even during the middle of a world war. Szyptycki begins his letter by emphasizing the church services and how the, uh, the fact that they are to be sung, perhaps addressing the problem of recited divine liturgies, a lamentable practice still present among some Greco-Catholics today. Prayer as a service to God must not only involve our mind and heart, but also our body and whole being. And he quotes Romans 12.1, rational worship, or logiki latria here. He says that it must include our sense of beauty, of melody, rhythm, and harmony. Although music is important, it is primarily subservient to the idea expressed by the prayer's text. The singing must confine itself to an interpretation of that text. And since the singing is to be prayer as such, it is never to supplant, alter, or destroy the text, nor should it vie for preeminence, since it is an augmentation of the gospel proclamation. Being prayer, church singing maintains an ethical character, which should lead the singers to avoid any expression of compositional or vocal showmanship achieved by contrived intricacy, in the words of Metropolitan Andre, or sensuality and passion, so that it expresses the Christian virtue of modesty and humility. Here we hear echoes of Maximus the Confessor and other patris patristic authors in these passages. Metropolitan Andrei Szeptyski makes it clear that, quote, our right also requires that all the people sing and in this way take part effectively in church services. This participation is a very important characteristic of our right. Through it, people learn the Christian life. And you see in the quotes here on the slide that in some cases, the services in church singing are more important than the sermon and catechization because they teach the faithful prayer. Szeptycki goes so far as to say that without the participation of the, pe of the people in the singing of the service, they are not included in the sacrifice and prayer of the priest. Now, despite the fact that Eastern Catholics have in many cases lost their own liturgical tradition due to the intrusion of foreign influences, and might consider the Orthodox churches as bearers of the tradition. Even Orthodox acknowledge the unique Byzantine Catholic reception of patristic mystagogy by the faithful through common participation in liturgical worship. The Russian Orthodox musicologist Ivan Gardner wrote about 40 years ago how in the Galician and Carpathian village churches of what is today Eastern Slovakia, Poland and Western Ukraine, that quote, singing at services was performed by the entire congregation. Each person had before him a book, a spornik, containing all the prescribed hymns. An experienced cantor, a diak, began the singing, and as soon as the familiar melody was heard, everyone, men, women, and children, joined in the singing, performing the entire service in this manner. Even the children knew many of the texts and by ear and could sing them from memory. In this way, the musical element in the service played an important part in the religious education of the masses, end of quote. And here on the slide, you see another uh, testimony of Gardner's experience of hearing church uh, congregational sing, saying only one who has heard it will really understand the beauty and says that attempts in other places to imitate it is like a puddle of water in comparison to a broad lake. Gardner also continues where Metropolitan Andrei Szeptycki left off, stating that it is not only the priest that serves the liturgy, but that everyone that sings, both those in the choir and those praying, do, or Slavonic, sovershayut, or serve, pravyet, the service together with the priest, deacon, and reader. This is possible only when the people are not passive listeners, so that they might truly be those who accomplish or celebrate the service, become in Slavonic, sovershetelami bohosluženia. So with time running out, I hope this cursory introduction to liturgical mystagogy from the perspective of the Byzantine rite has shown the important role hymnography has played 
historically and continues to play in explaining to the faithful the mystery of Christ. Rather than relying on an explanation of liturgy before or after the fact, the interconnectedness of the liturgical tradition through its various rites and symbols, scriptural readings and prayers draws on hymnography to explain to the faithful the mystery in which they are participating at the very moment of their communal worship, whether the sacraments or the sacrifice of praise in the liturgy of the hours. For Eastern Catholics, the urgent need at this time is not necessarily to reform, but first to restore and celebrate and better understand their liturgical tradition in keeping with the directives of the Second Vatican Council in a common effort of theologians, scholars, the hierarchy, clergy, monastics, and most importantly, the laity. The liturgy of the hours during which the scriptures are read, the prayers are said, and the hymns are sung are unfortunately absent in most Eastern Catholic parishes. Without a taste of these hymns during worship, it is impossible to explain something to the faithful of which they have no experience at all. As the mystagogy attributed to St. Dionysius the Areopagite states, how else are we to achieve imitation of God, if not by endlessly reminding ourselves of God's sacred works and doing so by way of the sacred hymns and the sacred acts. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Deacon Daniel. Uh, just to alert you, we have some time for questions. Uh, if you want to put a question in the question and answer box, uh, just uh, Thank you very much for your thoughtful Cook's tour through the hymnographic tradition of the, uh, the, the Byzantine Rite, as it is, uh, which you're an expert in. Um, one question that comes to us from Father Romanos Russo. You mentioned in several instances uh, St. Paul's phrase of rational worship, logike latria, which has so many you know, rich nuances as you yourself know. And Father uh, Romanos uh, brings to our attention, maybe this, and I wanna hear what you think about this. What do you think of the translation of Logike Latria as the worship of the word in which the word is both subjective and objective? It is Christ, the cosmic Christ who offers the sacrifice and it is Christ who is sacrificed. Yeah, um, thanks. That's a very good question. The um, logiki latria is, is certainly uh, a difficult uh, phrase to translate well into many languages. And even in Slavonic, they just did a kind of a word for word uh, translation, slovesnaya služba, taking logos as the root and just almost translating it uh, word for word. And then it sounds like it's just wordy worship. So you have to say a lot of different words um, to worship Christ. And it makes sense maybe in the context of St. Paul's epistle, where he says you have to use your whole body. So if you're using a lot of words, I don't know, maybe the Slavs uh, like to talk a lot, uh, or the translators at least, but this idea of worship of the word, the second person of the Trinity, uh, the incarnate word, I, I would personally say, I think that's where it's going, that it's worship in the mode or by the example of the word, maybe worship of the word exactly like that might give the impression that it is uh, just a worship, worshiping Christ, worshiping um, the word of God directly and not a worship that is also in the, by the example and the model of Christ. So in general, I would say that that's, that's probably what it means, at least in my understanding, I would love to hear other views on that or yeah. uh, read more on that. What immediately comes to mind is uh, Athanasius of Alexandria and on the incarnation and why does Christ the word become a human being, uh, uh, Christ the logos to make us logical, but not smarter, but really in conformity uh, with uh, Christ the logos himself, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. that probably is uh, the germ of that is in this uh, St. Paul and certainly the the fruit of that is in the liturgical tradition as well. Probably why rational is maybe not the best, but better than spiritual, because it then gives the impression that the 
that it is something that is not necessarily material or opposed to material and not incarnated, but just um, spiritual. So that's unfortunately another translation that exists, spiritual versus rational, but worship of the word, worship in the spirit of the word and the mode of the word and the example of the word. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear you speak to this. Uh, uh, Julian Haida writes that some melodies don't, you emphasize this congregational participation, yet some melodies don't necessarily lend themselves to congregational singing. He has in mind uh, some of the more elegant Byzantine chants, some of our uh, Irmoy, etc. How do you think that worked logistically? Uh, did every baptized person sing those, or was that just the canon arc? Was it a round robin? Are there solo melodies and innovation, or, or perhaps the ascetical dimension of learning something difficult? Is there spiritual benefit to that? Yeah, um, that's also a good point because one should not think that everybody was singing these extremely complex melodies, basically from the first amen to the last amen, that everybody would be singing everything. And um, whether it's Byzantine and then Slavonic uh, translations into Slavonic of monastic or liturgical typica um, or even Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky's uh, decree on church singing, which you uh, can read online. Uh, there was the link on one of the slides uh, in English translation. There is often an emphasis on the parts that definitely uh, address the faithful saying, let us all say, or let us uh, pray um, to the Lord that the people should answer. You even find this in Slavonic typica. Uh, so liturgical ordos or uh, monastic guidebooks. So, and Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky also was um, conscious of the importance of uh, fostering um, musical, uh, the musical arts, creativity, composers. Uh, I think the emphasis though was on making sure that what they were doing was in the spirit and in the mind of the church and that this was directed to God in worship. And so in that case, Definitely, there are some things that would be done just by some core group sp specialist because um, some of these melodies are indeed extremely complex. And so it wouldn't be expected that everybody would do it, but um, definitely litanies, things like the Our Father um, or other hymns that are kind of a call and response or antiphonal singing uh, would definitely involve all the faithful. So. Um, that, that's a good question to clarify that not everything from start to finish because uh, would be sung by everybody because there is definitely um, a lot of complex stuff in the Byzantine tradition. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question from Bishop uh, David Motiuk who appreciated your comments on the losing the significance of the resurrection and the baptismal connection at the Paschal Vigil. Um, he, oh, I just lost the question. He asks us, you know, he's had to deal with that problem, especially during this pandemic of how to negotiate these sacrosanct uh, folk blessings of, of meats. Um, what would be your pastoral suggestion to move people toward a proper understanding of the celebration of the resurrection of Christ at Pascha? Yeah. Uh... Well, I'm glad that question is coming from a bishop because bishops can actually do something. So, and uh, maybe we should all check in in the Bishop David's FRK next year to see how he does. Um, but the one thing would be to really, I think the first step is to emphasize uh, the community, community liturgical life every week. Because if you just throw this on, uh, the community that, okay, here's Holy Saturday, and all of a sudden you're going to have to do Vespers with the baptism and a liturgy of St. Basil, and you're going to have to make it nice so people want to come back again, and they've never done this. That doesn't, that won't fly. So um, it would probably be a progression of making sure people are catechized or understanding what's going on in the divine liturgy, uh, restoring Saturday evening Vespers, making texts accessible to people, and um, I'm not sure if my screen is still being shared. I have a slide with various places where you, well, you can, for Ukrainian Catholics, which uh, Bishop David uh, is at the Eparch of Edmonton, there are lots of resources online in English or Ukrainian. So start probably with an understanding of Sunday, which begins on Saturday night with Vespers, 
and build up to this. And if the community is invited to this celebration of um, the new life in the community on Holy Saturday, uh, if it becomes really a communal experience, then they'll understand that the focus doesn't need to be on blessing the Easter basket. That can be uh, put back to Sunday uh, afternoon, Sunday late morning after they finish um, matins and liturgy. And something that actually exists, I think, in, um, in most rural contexts in the Greek Catholic world, that the blessing of Easter baskets and all that is still on uh, Sunday late morning um, probably in places where the community life is still stronger. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I think it needs to be built up gradually by under, restoring Sunday first, uh, understanding it in its fullness, and then the other uh, pieces of the puzzle will fall into place, hopefully. And just to continue striving for uh, that, that positive restoration and um, just, uh, yeah, continuing. Thank you. Um, one question. We talked about sort of the that comment of Ivan uh, von Gardner and his uh, appreciation for the congregational participation, which he sought to restore in his own work as a musicologist. Uh, Lisa Gilbert asks, were there other non-Byzantine Eastern Christian traditions that had any theological reasons for not having the lady participate or in singing? Or is it something that just sort of casually got lost over time, you think? So the question is about lay participation, but beyond the Byzantine tradition. Yeah, but you could also maybe speak to how that came into place within the Byzantine tradition as well. Yeah, um, so I think there will be some um, presentations in this series about Syriac Christianity, and they have a very strong hymnographic tradition that also has sermons in the forms of hymnography from the Syrian, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they're experts on that tradition that will be able to answer both the historical and the contemporary practices. There were groups of, um, uh, I think, daughters of the covenant uh, in the Syriac tradition that would be basically choirs of, um, I don't believe they were uh, considered nuns, so lay people, lay women, and also then there would be men uh, that would uh, be involved with singing. So this is a tradition present in beyond um, the, the congregational side of this um, exists in, in all Christian traditions. Um, the development in the Byzantine tradition of how that the congregational singing was lost, uh, there's actually a, a good study of this by Melita Mudri, uh, in Logos, Journal of Eastern Christian Studies, where she traces actually in liturgical books how you see the term for people or um, basically develop into a term for choir uh, in printed liturgical books to see how um, it becomes professionalized. We also see that in Constantinople, where you have professional singers that take over and um, then include the faithful by singing refrains uh, to antiphons or certain responses, but um, it becomes uh, professionalized there more often to the point at which uh, there could just be one singer and the people are like uh, just silent the whole service. And it seems to be a great uh, success when you get them to say the Our Father or the Creed together in the liturgy or sing uh, some other hymns together. But even Gardner points out in his observation that this is nothing in compared uh, comparison to the the experience that he's, he's seen of whole churches singing uh, services together. That's great. Um, just a question, you know, in your, your own uh, experience of the Ukrainian church, um, Mikhail Nadav asks, the Byzantine rite is celebrated in many different churches in many different cultures, therefore in many different languages. For example, in the Melkite church, the vernacular was Greek, Syriac, or Arabic, depending on the era and location. How is sacred language preserved, and what's the traditional balance, in your opinion, between vernacular and sacred, sacred language, and how would this affect congregational singing? Yeah, that's an excellent question, because um, that's also one observation about a lot of Byzantine hymnography that people always, scholars are asking the question, how much of this would people have understood by hearing it? Uh, because there's 
very complex poetic meter. There's wordplay that you will often only get if you are seeing the page, the written text, and how many people actually would be standing in church with the text in front of them. Um, so I think the importance of access, uh, access to text and uh, comprehensibility in terms of language is definitely in um, definitely an extremely important factor. And Gardner points out that it's because people had these books. This is in the Austro-Hungarian Empire where uh, education was being promoted and book printing was, um, liturgical book printing was thriving in uh, what is today Lviv and in Ujhorod or yeah, Ujhorod. Um, so people had these texts. So when things aren't understood, so vernacular is extremely important and it's it's also a tradition of the Christian East. The idea of a sacred language um, does exist, but for many Eastern Christian traditions, uh, for example, the Coptic tradition or, or Syriac traditions, they will use Greek words, small phrases. Even the Byzantine tradition will have many Greek phrases that are uh, sung at solemn occasions, uh, but the vernacular was always uh, cherished and promoted and so it's only when the vernacular that was used gets uh, a bit archaic that it loses the understanding, uh, the, f the faithful lose the understanding for it, whether through church Slavonic or um, Byzantine Greek, that um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to uncover the meaning of these, these hymns. And then we have uh, positive influences from the liturgical movement that uh, encourage the faithful to understand what's actually being sung and going on in these these services. Very good. Yeah. Um, in your estimation, um, Father Joseph Matlack asks, uh, how important, it, you know, we're in this American culture, uh, there's this evangelical mandate that uh, Orientalium Ecclesiarum puts upon the Eastern churches in a very deliberate way, in some ways for the first time for the Eastern churches. Um, and so Father Joseph has this question, how important and urgent would you say it is to consider composing music for languages and contexts other than those for which they were originally composed? For example, North America, the West. Yeah, so um, this is something that I think Eastern Catholics aren't really... Um, successful with but that North American Orthodox are, are doing quite a lot and surprisingly I would say in the area of Byzantine chant uh, there have been some some progress made. Um, if you look at books from uh, Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Brookline, Massachusetts, there they have very extensive introductions where they explain that the, they're striving to transmit the meter of Greek that exists in Greek hymnography into English. And in many cases, they're quite successful. Um, and so it means not necessarily changing the musical tradition, but making the texts without compromising the theological content or, or um, the clarity or the style, making it work with this musical tradition. And um, from what I've observed, I think this is not a bad approach because um, no matter where you go in the world, if you know Byzantine chant, you can sing in whatever language. If you know the basics of the different modes of the eight tones, you can simply come with your different language text if it's done well and metered, and you can sing together. Um, with Slavs, didn't really put so much emphasis on translating into Slavonic the Greek meter. And so that means that uh, the meter is completely lost in Slavonic text. And so any um, English, for example, in North American English translations or French translations that are going from the Slavonic tradition aren't focusing on uh, necessarily having the meter uh, be so important. So um, I would say perhaps the composition of new melodies is something that must be considered alongside translations that fit the meter of the original. There have been others though that have composed, you can find it on YouTube as well, an appellation, Christ is risen, which has a catchy uh, melody that definitely sounds very kind of authentically American and it's quite beautiful. Um, but whether a whole liturgical tradition uh, should develop around uh, appellation chant, 
Um, I'm not sure, I guess that we'll see in a hundred years or we won't see, but we'll. Yeah. Uh, we have time for maybe just one more question and, and maybe this kind of brings it to the contemporary circumstance that we're in. Uh, Yvette Dubois uh, asks that in the face of COVID-19, um, how have you observed Eastern congregations attempting to be true to the singing tradition while protecting the congregations? Mm -hmm. uh, protecting the congregation? Yeah, because of you know, the, uh, social distancing issues. Uh, yeah, yeah. Issues. Um, yeah, so this is a difficult question because very often different places have different regulations. Uh, on what is permitted and what is not permitted, right? Um, so in general, uh, and in fact, uh, singing is one, um, one aspect of uh, distancing or uh, safety that, is, that it was uh, identified several months ago, I would say, and, and people were for saying to stop uh, singing or um, or um, or limit what can be done, um, so I think the there wherever communities were able to authentically live their tradition or were successful in um, in uniting their community community before, they were able to adapt in some ways. But where there was difficulty before, I think that uh, there would be Ex extremely uh, extreme difficulties to kind of start from scratch after after COVID-19. So in general, the Byzantine Rite has a lot of possibilities for adapting little things here or there. For example, um, at the parish where I am right now, because you're not allowed to distribute books to people according to um, to regulations here in this eparchy, the idea of a kanonarch has been restored. So you have one person with a book who intones the verse that people are supposed to sing. Uh, and if they can't sing, they can at least hear it one time. And then they're supposed to repeat, of course, uh, wearing their, their masks. So the, an ancient tradition of the kanonarch has been restored uh, thanks to COVID-19, um, which uh, it makes the service longer, but it uh, allows people to internalize the text and then repeat it. Um, but unfortunately, there, there's a lot of pressure to limit singing or, um, or stop choirs, uh, choral singing. Um, in some places, unison singing is, is a solution because uh, you don't have to rely on different voices. And in a way, this re-emphasizes the importance of the authentic chant tradition. Thank you, Daniel. Um, well, let me uh, thank both of you, uh, Father Andrew and Daniel, for um, helping kick off, um, really Deacon Daniel, helping kick off this series in a great way um, and giving us an exposure to this aspect of the um, Eastern Christian tradition um, that might be unfamiliar for a lot of people. Um, and I'd like to invite each of our uh, attendees here to join us again next week um, as we host um, Dr. Andrew Hayes from the University of St. Thomas in Houston for a theology of wonder, an introduction to the poetry of Ephraim the Syrian. Um, the Syriac tradition is a, a significant part of um, Christian history that often is obscured um, when one solely focuses on, uh, on the West. And so I would invite people to join for exploring this rich aspect of a tradition that we all share, um, that that's part of our shared heritage. Um, I uh, want to just further once more thank um, all of our co-sponsors um, who helped make this event a success and invite you to help support us as well. I'd invite you to, to spread word about next week's event. Um, if you've enjoyed this event, share it with your friends, share it with those within your, your congregation um, or, or students within your Class. Um, and you're also welcome to support us financially um, by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Um, and then finally, I want to thank Father Andrew, Deacon Daniel, um, and Deacon Daniel, the choir that joined you there for helping to um, bring into prayer 
um, Father Paul tonight um, and, and uh, Priest Paul, um, Father Andrew, as you said, and, and helping us all to, uh, to commemorate this uh, great priest, this great scholar, and this great man. Um, thank you once again, and hopefully you can join us again next week.